be read soon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, David. Thank you so much for uh, talking with me today. It's my pleasure. Could you uh, tell me uh, what's exciting about this year's IMPAR? There are a lot of really cool things exciting about this year's IMPAR. I think probably the two most exciting things uh, are uh, sort of at opposite ends of the scientific spectrum. So the first one relates to our really much stronger understanding of neurobiology of autism. So I think the study that Eric Corshain presented and his keynote address this morning were very exciting in talking about how we're really beginning to understand how the brains of people with autism differ from other people and not just how they differ at any point in time, but how they develop differently. And I think that that's going to be really important for us ultimately in understanding um, uh, how those brains function and how that in turn relates to behavior. And so how do autistic brains differ? Well, that's something you're going to have to talk more to Eric about than to me. But um, I think his big finding is that you find very early in life that infants with autism experience this, um, th they're growing more neurons and they're growing more axons than other kids. Really? Okay. Um, so their brains are, if we think about those neurons, are as what makes the connections between different parts of the brain that allow different parts of the brain to communicate with each other and operate in sync, he's saying that those brains are, are making many, many more connections than we would expect. Um, and that's affecting the way they talk to each other. That's affecting the way they interact with each other. And then what starts to happen in the second year of life and later in life is what some people refer to as pruning. That is, the, those, uh, the brain is trying to compensate for all those extra connections by reducing some of those okay. connections. But it doesn't reduce the right connections? or Well, that, that, I think that's still to be, okay. to be found out. And again, I, like, he's really the one you want to talk to about that. Okay. Um, my, my research is sort of on the other end of the scientific continuum where we're talking more about, we, 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 start, we started to know a lot more about what autism looks like, what potentially causes it, and how to uh, how to care for people with autism and provide them the supports and services that they need. One of the big challenges we have is we've learned all about that in university-based research settings, and it hasn't really made its way into uh, community settings. So when we look at the kinds of supports and interventions and services that people with autism get in the community, they usually don't look like what we would think of as best practice. And I think that the autism research community is finally starting to turn its attention to that and thinking about what we should be doing now to improve quality of care. And there's a whole body of research that's being developed around what some people call implementation science or type 2 translational research that, that's focusing on these issues of immediately improving quality of care. Could you uh, explain the research that you're doing? So the research, so that kind of implementation research is often the research that I've been involved in. What we presented here uh, today is, or, or, or this week at IMPAR is a little different. Um, one of the things that I and, and a postdoctoral fellow of mine, Zuleha Sadav, are really interested in is what are the consequences of having a child with autism on the family? And when I say consequences specifically here, we're thinking about economic consequences. So she did a really great study in which she used um, a data set called the Medical Expenditures Panel Survey, which is a national survey of families about the health of their children and the welfare of those children and, and families. And so she compared the experiences of families of children with autism to families of children with um, where the family described the child as having any health limitation, and then to families of children where the parent described the child as having no health limitations. And what she found was that uh, mothers in families of children with autism uh, end up working a lot less. Many fewer of them are employed uh, than in other families, even more so than families of children with other health limitations. And does that uh, create less economic income? Or? So, so that seems to be exactly the end result, that on average those families are making uh, about $17,600 less a year than families of typically developing children. And that translates into something like a 27% difference in income. That's, uh, that's quite a big discrepancy. It is a big discrepancy. And so you have to start wondering about why that discrepancy exists. And I don't think it's because caring for a child with autism or is more burdensome, per se, than caring for children with other health limitations. I think where the difference lies in what the system of care is for children with autism versus children with other health limitations. So 
uh, often when you have a child, say, with intellectual disability or with a very specific learning disability or very phys uh, specific physical health condition, there's a clearly established standard of care. You know what intervention you're supposed to get and how intensive it's going to be. It's often very clear who pays for it, whether it's the education system or the health care system, and how much they'll pay for it. And so those families may have more out-of-pocket expenses or other things like that, but, um, but the care system is pretty well established. I think for many families of children with autism, uh, it's not really clear what the standard of care should be, and it's not really clear who should pay for it. Uh, okay. And so families often end up fighting for services in a way that other families of children with health care needs don't. So those families of children with autism end up having to struggle for services and fight for services for those kids in a way that families of children with other health care limitations sure. don't. And I think what ends up happening is that those mothers drop out of the workforce to become the case managers for their kids um, and end up fighting with insurance companies and the education system to get appropriate care for, uh, yeah. for their children. Um, and it, so it will be very interesting to see what happens. You know, Autism Speaks, for example, is taking a lead role in lobbying for, uh, for uh, insurance mandates that require healthcare insurers to cover services for autism. And so I think an important future study will be to look at what the effect of these kinds of policy level interventions are on reducing economic burden on families and keeping those mothers in the workforce. Uh, what future research uh, do you hope to, to do? The kind of research that I'm very interested in is how do we change the system of care for people with autism so that they get the care they need and their families are able to, uh, to, to pay attention to their children and not pay attention to their children's care in the same way. So we do a lot of research on improving quality of care in the community, um, thinking about these kinds of policy issues like mandates and the effects they have on families with the idea that if we can intervene in this way, then we'll be improving quality of life, not just for people with autism, but for their families as well. Sure. Um, do you have anything else to add? Um, I really appreciate the opportunity for the interview. I think you guys are doing a great job capturing what's important about this conference. Thanks so much, uh, and, and thank you so much for talking to me. It's my pleasure. All right. All right? Yep. Thanks so okay. much. Okay. Sure.